You might see two different formulas for a two-sample t-test, the unpooled formula and the pooled formula. What's the difference, and why might we use one over the other? When each of your friends doesn't have enough money for pizza, you can pool your money together, and then you can afford the pizza. Pool is just a fancy word for combine. By pooling resources, you can accomplish more than you could alone. When each of your data sets has trouble estimating the variance, you sometimes can pool the information from all groups. Pool is just a fancy word for combine. Let's see this in action with a two-sample t-test. Sometimes we want to compare the averages of two groups. Is the average height of men equal to the average height of women? We might ask ourselves our null hypothesis. Is mu men equal to mu women? Is the average height of all men equal to the average height of all women? This is the same thing as asking is, is mu men minus mu women equal to zero? Well, to estimate the true difference in the averages, we compute the difference we see in our sample, the average height of men minus the average height of women. We want to know if the observed difference is large, and whether we're going to consider it large depends on how variable our estimate is. The t statistic that we calculate is the observed difference over the standard error. And what is the standard error of the difference of means? Well, in reality, this is the standard error. It involves the true variances of both groups and their sample sizes. So n men and n women are the sample sizes, and sigma squared men and sigma squared women are the true variances of each group. But we don't know the real variances. We don't even know the means. That's what we're trying to figure out. So how could we know the variances? And that's why we often do a t-test where we estimate these variances. So we could estimate this quantity by replacing the true variances sigma with the sample variances s. These are the sample variances of each group that are easily computed from the data. And we can do this. It's called the unpooled standard error. And we can do a two sample unpooled t-test. It took statisticians a little while to figure this out, how to use the t-distribution in this situation and what the degrees of freedom should be. This is called the Baron Fisher's problem. The degrees of freedom for this approximation is quite complicated. This means that an unpooled t-test is often done with statistical software because we don't want to compute this number ourselves. But a computer can handle that now, so it's not that bad. But if someone didn't figure this out, what else could we have done? So what is the standard error? How could we estimate it? Well, what if we believe that the standard deviation of each group was the same? Here's an example of some data where the standard deviation for men and women are the same. Even though they have different means, the variance, the standard deviation, is the same. Here's an example where they have unequal variances. You can see that the men in blue have a much wider variation in height. But we might think that this is a more reasonable assumption. So if we believe the standard deviations are equal, why differentiate between them? Let's just call them both sigma. And if they're both sigma, we can actually factor out the sigma and write it like this. But we still don't know what that sigma is. So let's estimate it. And let's pool or combine the information from the two groups to estimate their common variance. If we estimate the variances separately, we would have the formulas like this. The men's variance is estimated as the average square distance of the points from their mean. The women's variance is estimated as the average square distance of the points from their mean. But if we pooled the groups together, then we could compute the pooled variance. This is the sum of the square deviations of the first group from their mean, and we add them to the sum of the square deviations of the second group from their mean. And then we and then we take the sum of these n1 plus n2 squared deviations, and we compute their average by dividing by n1 plus n2 minus 2. So it's the degrees of freedom, which has a minus 2. So it's not exactly the sample size, but this is an average. And the equivalent way to write this is that the pooled variance is a weighted average of the variance of the first group, weighted by its sample size, plus the variance of the second group, weighted by its sample size. It's a weighted average of the two variances. Is there any advantage to pooling the variance this way, besides the fact that we may have been forced to if the Barron's fisher problem was never solved? Well, the major advantage of pooling the variances is that if the variances are truly the same, we get to use all of our data to get a more accurate estimate of the common variance. For example, look at this dot plot here of men and women's heights. 
If we estimate the variances separately and we only have five people in each group, the variance estimate will likely not really be that accurate. But an estimate using the information from all 10 people will be much more accurate because we're using more data. There are some smaller advantages too. The degrees of freedom for the pooled test is simply n1 plus n2 minus 2, which is much easier than that crazy complicated formula when we don't pool the variances. And honestly, this is probably why a lot of statistics textbooks teach the pool test. You can do it more easily without a calculator. And a minor advantage is that the degrees of freedom is higher, resulting in smaller confidence intervals. Although honestly, this is sort of related to the major advantage, which is that we're pooling our information. The degrees of freedom we get from the complicated formula is smaller than n1 plus n2 minus 2. Now, what's the disadvantage? Well, if the equal variance assumption is incorrect, then this doesn't make any sense and all your results are totally wrong. Yikes. Probably just do the unpooled t-test. Why take the risk? Now, do we do this for any other type of statistical test? Well, in the extension to the two-sample t-test, ANOVA, which is when we have more than two groups, we have to assume all the groups have equal variances, and there's no way around this unless we do a completely different test, like a Kruskal-Wallis test, which is called a non-parametric test because it doesn't rely on these assumptions. We also do this in linear regression, where we assume homoscedasticity, which means we pull the variance of the residuals from all the observations. Here's the relationship between height and weight. For newborn babies, there's very little variation in weight, but for someone who's six feet tall, there's a lot of variation. So how much variation is there? Well, it obviously depends on your height. But in standard linear regression, we assume that there's equal variance throughout, and we pool or average the variation from all ends, which would give us a variance somewhere in the middle, but that won't give us accurate estimates when we're down here or up here. So sometimes this causes issues just like pooling does in the two sample t-test. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe to learn more statistics.